Hi, everyone. I apologize for not being there in person. I'm not sure how much was related to you, but due to an unforeseen uh, medical situation, I had to quarantine myself for the next few days. So I'm stuck in my office over the next few days. So I appreciate the hard work that MMA has been doing behind the scenes to make sure that I was still be uh, still able to participate in this year's 2024 Leadership Summit uh, in Brandon, Manitoba. I was just recently there, and I can say it's a wonderful community. Uh, I'm assuming there's still some work going on behind the scenes here. Uh, so I can see the panelists. Yes, here we go. There we go. Um, I do want to say that this is a... A uh, great partnership between the MMA and myself, the host of Municipal Affairs, a podcast that is dedicated to speaking with stakeholders from across Canada on issues related to municipalities. Uh, this is our fourth in a series dedicated to the role of the CAO. Now, in the vast landscapes of municipal governance, where decisions ripple through communities and shape the lives of citizens, the quality of the relationship between council members and administrators stands as an indispensable cornerstone of success. Our mission over the next hour is to dissect the complexities of contemporary politics and administrations within municipalities, exploring the paths by which administrators can effectively lead amidst the shifting tides of the political landscape. Now, as we gather, the overarching question will become clear by the end of this recording, and that is, in today's political climate, how and where should municipal administrators lead? Guiding our exploration are seasoned panelists, each bringing a wealth of experience and insights honed through years of service within the municipal sector. The session will be broken up into four different segments, but before we start, I want to give each of our panelists a quick moment to introduce themselves for our recording as well. And if possible, and I'm going to say that quick, quick 10 to 15 second introduction for our recording, if possible, tell us how long they have been with their in their current position. So I'm going to start with Ron, if possible. Ron, introduce yourself and how long you've been with your current organization. Hi, Chris. I'm Ron Bowles. I'm responsible for building and serving community. I do so with pride in three years. And I've been here for the last three years. Awesome. Thank you. Now we'll switch it over to Nicole. You introduce yourself and how long you've been in your current position. Hi, Chris. My name is Nicole Chicola. I am the vice president of MMA and also the CAO for the Army's office. I've been there for almost six years now. Awesome. And now we'll throw it over to Mike, how long you've been with your organization. And I see that you're wearing a Winnipeg's Jet jersey. I won't hold that against you as an Anaheim Ducks fan, but that's just me saying that as a Calgarian who should be rooting for the Flames. So, Mike, how long you've been with your organization? Yeah, I, I would pretend I'm simply, but, but I know, Chris, so thank you. Uh, and I think on today to be a game day where I uh, stop my own superstition of, uh, of making sure I'm wearing the So Thank you. Uh, I'm Michael Jack. I'm the chief minister of the city of Winnipeg. Been in this role about uh, two and a half years. Uh, yeah, coming on three years, uh, and in various other roles in the city, I was office for a number of years before that. I have been with the city since July 2000 uh, in some other capacities, primarily in the legal front of the board of the city of Thanks. Awesome. Thank you so much, Mike. And now over to our last panelist, Heather. Can you just quickly introduce yourself and how long you've been with uh, your uh, organization and with MMA? Sure. Uh, my name is Heather Watson, and I have been in my current position for not quite two years because I just retired. <laughs> <laughs> I worked with the city of Brown for 32 years, but I, my last position was directed by the city services, which I was in that role for nine years before I retired. Um, and I also am the past president of the MMA and the uh, LA Awesome. Thank you so much to our panelists for participating today. And we're going to start off, if we don't mind, by heading into an audience participation question. So if we can, if everyone can pull out their mentee program where you have a quick question to start off the line of questioning and our first segment. So the first question I would like, if everyone can answer, we'll give everyone about 60 seconds to respond is, how would you currently rate the relationship between your council and administration today? 
Would you rate it poor, unsatisfactory working relationship, fair, below average working relationship, good, above average working relationship, or excellent, exceptional working relationship? Now, I should note that these are all anonymous, so be as honest as possible. I promise when I speak to municipal oh, leaders across right. Manitoba, though they will not be uh, talked about in those conversations, so oh. be as honest as possible here. So actually, Lena, leave the word this. It's fine. Okay, and I go to menti.com, M E N T I.com. Apologize. I'm not my fault. The two five nine eight five nine nine five. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Two five nine eight five nine nine five. So we're just gonna give it sixty seconds. Thank you so much for everyone for participating. Uh, I just want to remind everyone, the question is, how would you currently rate the relationship between your council and administration today? One poor, two fair, three good, or four excellent. Uh, I'll give it a few more seconds here. We seem to have a early favorite. I'm not sure if the Winnipeg Jets are the early favorites for the cup this year, but it seems like we have an early favorite in the room for their current relationship between council and administration. Uh, we'll give it a few more seconds here. We're almost at about 100 people. So if we can get to about 110, 115, then we will go to our line of questions, which I will lead off by asking Ron a question here. So Ron, you will be first up. So be prepared for the first line of questions. So we've got about 102. Uh, so we still have an early leader with a good above average working relationship between council and administration. Uh, so with that, as the still numbers are rolling in, so continue to fill that in as you can. I'm going to ask Ron a, a quick uh, direct question to uh, start off this sort of line of questioning around relationships. So Ron, from your perspective, what defines a successful relationship between council and administration in today's context of political and administration relations? Thanks, Brett. I uh, get a little eerie to understand my hair going back. Um, I, I, I define it in, in three areas, Chris. Uh, the first one is um, everybody has to understand the rules of the game. So working closely with your administration, working closely with your council on understanding um, maybe role clarity. So everybody knows where, you know, what their job is in, in running the city. Um, so that would be number one. Um, but on that, I mean, we all know we, uh, the administration uh, and, and the CAOs is, is, is the head of that. Uh, is responsible for the day to day. Uh, and for council, they're responsible for the long term. So, anyways, but everybody, administration and council understand uh, their, their part in this game that we're playing. Uh, the other one is communication, communication, and communication. You have to continually be talking to your council. No surprises. Uh, you Every forum that you can, don't just pick one and you know, email and counsel, um, or just talking to the community council chamber, but um, and don't just talk to just council, talk to the council as well. So make sure you're always communicating with council, of course, the mayor is the key role, and that has to be a minimum every week you have to be to the mayor. Uh, and the third item is don't be afraid to have extended conversations. It's hard um, sometimes to, to bring up the hard stuff. The people maybe don't want to hear the hard stuff. Sometimes you have to bring up the public forum and make it extra hard. Um, so don't be afraid to have those hard conversations. 
No, I, I appreciate that. But I do want to just pick up on that last statement that you just said is having those hard conversations. Does that come over time? Is that something that you can have those hard conversations on day one of the job? Or is it something that you have to work on through a relationship building process? Well, Chris, yes, absolutely. It is a relationship and the dynamic between you know, the city managers, the CAO, and the council is a relationship. Um, but you always have a tough conversation whenever whenever it's time to have a tough conversation. But for me, you know, I'm three years into this role. Um, obviously, the day three years ago when I showed up here, there was no tough conversation to have because I like, didn't know them. Um, but you know, as you just as as your mentality evolves and and uh, you you bring it up now. I appreciate that. Now I'm going to head over. Oh, go ahead. Uh, now I'm going to head over to Mike, if if you don't mind. Uh, considering the complexities of local governance and various stakeholders' interest. How have you navigated potential conflicts or disagreements between your council and your administration? Hopefully well, but, but that's hopefully. Um, it, 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 it's really situation dependent, but, but I'm not going to just leave the answer there. Um, what's really kind of key, you know, I found this key, and I've even had, you know, the mayor point this out that, I, I'm reminded of the saying, you know, when you're everybody's friend, you're nobody's friend. Um, our council needs to know that the CAO is laser focused on delivering their priorities. That's that's why you're in that role. That's why they hire you. Um, it, it is a significant part of your job to do so. Um, but you're also the, the administrative leader of your entire public service. And Winnipeg, that's a little over 10,000 employees. Uh, and and so to to only be serving council without uh, being a staunch supporter defender of 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 the public service would, would get you nowhere at least in the medium and long term. So um, building up the credibility and, and it does take some time building up the credibility so that when when you need to uh, defend the administrative sort of action, your elected officials can actually respect that it's not because you're a cheerleader. It's not because you see your role primarily as advocate, uh, and particularly see your role as advocate for status quo, which in some cases may be uh, less efficient uh, service delivery than, than they would like. Um, taking your battles in that respect, uh, I, I think it's really, really fundamental to understanding to, to having the trust so that when you are, are offering the uh, you know, very good and expecting them to rely upon and expect them to accept your recommendations, you know, just build that up. So uh, again, kind of different in, in every scenario, but uh, one thing I've tried to strive towards probably my entire career is uh, if, if people know that you are being straightforward with them, if you are saying the same thing in a room of briefing your counsel as you would be saying in front of uh, a department an issue or even a stakeholder group, group an issue, um, that goes a long way. That's not something you can create overnight. Uh, I, I know so many people in this room who live by that, and that uh, often takes a, an entire career to build up that kind of credibility. That is likely why some people, uh, you know, it can take an entire career before you uh, end up in senior administration, and there's likely a reason for that because so much more than the skill set you got to bring to the role, uh, it ends up being uh, that that intangible. Uh, credibility and, and and the confidence you can inspire and inspire in those seemingly disparate groups. So on the flip side of that question, Mike, if you don't mind me asking, because you talk about being a cheerleader for administration, but how, how important is it not to be a cheerleader for council when dealing with administration as well? Because you want to walk that fine balance of being, building that relationship between council and administration, and you can't seem to favor one side over the other. Okay, I'll, I'll cut out. Back to your point, Ron made about having the right systems in place. To, to my mind, that's where that's where proper governance is just so so key. 
Um, because again, if, if you've got if you've got those right processes in place, um, you know, I, in Winnipeg, uh, you know, we've got a variety of personalities, a variety of characters on our council. It's about as deep as I'm going to go into that. The, um, many of them understand governance incredibly well. Many of them might be new, uh, and and they know they showed up to to get what they want to. They've got objectives. They've got priorities. They may not have read the city organization bylaw. They may not, may not care that much about how the procedure is supposed to go. But that, and and maybe even with the best of intentions, they are just trying to achieve something. Um, again, if, if they if they see that you are you understand your role, you don't have a dog in the race. Uh, you are there to best and most efficiently and most effectively apply those rules that they have created that they are ultimately uh, the authors of. Um, I, you know, that's the best foot forward you can, you can put, and uh, it, it doesn't always work. And, and there, I, I've got, you know, I, I can think of a, a list of, of instances where, uh, despite having the right justification, uh, you're still not going to be able to deliver the thing that that elected official wanted. Um, what, what comes with that, and I know everyone in this room likely practices some variation of that. Um, you know, it's it, you may not be able to do it, but but how, how do you get them there? Uh, and that's where that's a really great part of this role, which I love, which is uh, you know, if, if what they're asking to do, what they're trying to do, where they need to go, uh, just doesn't work. It runs afoul of, of rules that you have, you know, sworn to uphold. Um, figure out how to get them there, figure out where they're coming from, focus, you know, the old willing security, focus on their interests, figure out what's really at the root of this thing, and, and there's usually some way. With your team, uh, that you can try to support them. I think if they see you do, doing that, if they perceive that you really are trying, uh, that, that gives even more credence to the rule you were trying to enforce uh, because they understand this isn't about resistance to the idea or the objective. Uh, and uh, again, hopefully over time, that's the kind of thing that can go to strength with this goal as well. Thank you so much, Mike. Now over to you, Nicole. Same qu original question, if you don't mind, but put it on from a rural perspective lens. How do you navigate potential conflicts or disagreement between your council administration? Because in smaller rural communities, whether you be up in Dauphin or uh, down in the Steinbach area or Bossier or over in uh, Brandon area in Stifton, uh, how do you challenge uh, navigate those complexities and challenges of potential conflicts or disagreement because in smaller communities traditionally everyone knows everyone and people will know you down the street or your council member or your uh greater yeah. operator yeah it's a it's a great question and it's a lot different in small small communities when you see a military role or understand and um there's no hiding from from the challenge that we face, right? We do run into citizens and, and everyone at you know Walmart or the lunch or wherever is, is always following with us. But um I think the best thing we can do is to face it head on. I mean we you know went to people, we understand what's going on. We can't hide from it in a small community. So when we we communicate clearly, right? We we don't hide anything, we try to make sure that they know what's going on to the best of our ability. And and um, you know just sort of relaying what it is we're working through, right? That we're doing this for a purpose. We're trying to get through it, and I think by being transparent and sort of having those communications with everybody and making sure they're in the know about what's going on, it really does seem to make make a positive impact and the exception on dealing with the challenges is usually better, and the reviews seem to come out of it on top of it. You talk about transparency, and I want to pick up on that for a second, if you don't mind, because transparency has been key when I speak to municipal leaders is how do they uh, tell their residents the issues that are faced without knowing all the facts? So how important is it to be as completely transparent as possible when building that relationship with a council or even with administration on the day to day operations of what's going on in your community? Yeah, I mean, it, it's key, right? Particularly when you're building that relationship with council, you have to build that, that trust, and they have to know what you're doing beyond with them and vice versa. And, and I think the more you can build that with your council and your kin team, the more that naturally sort of flows out into the public. Um, you know, we know that we can straight talk to each other, and there's a line of what we can say what we can't, but 
we we respect when we can do transparency to the council meeting internally, and so uh, because we see the benefit, it's easy to to put that forward to the public as well. I want to throw it over to Heather here for sort of the last question before I open it up to a general question to all four of you. And Heather, what initiatives or practices do you believe are most effective in fostering trust and collaboration between council members and administration staffs within a municipal setting? Thank you. I think there's a few things that you can do to build trust with your council. First and foremost, is the communication part of it. Having those open, transparent discussions. Uh, and, and not, you know, sometimes we fall into that trap. I think of that famous line by Jeremy that there's a few good man. You can't handle the truth. You can't. You can handle the truth. And you have to be upfront with them about what the situation might entail. I think another important point is to carry through with what you promise your council or what you commit to. Um, there's nothing worse, I think, than to destroy trust with the council when they're something that they've asked you to do doesn't pursue or gets lost in the in the paperwork. And six months later, they're at a standstill because they don't know where things are at. So I think you have to be diligent and, and following up when you commit with the council as well, communicating with them and being honest with them, having those frank discussions. Uh, they're not easy sometimes. Obviously, we get into situations where the truth is not what they want to hear, but it's important that they have all aspects in order to make the best decision. So I think those are important building blocks when you're trying to develop that trust relationship with your child. How important is it to, back to Heather here, how important is it to have that continuous conversation with the mayor or all of council? Does it just happen at the council meetings or should it happen sort of one-on-one -on -one prior to council meetings, uh, a week before? Is it a weekly meeting? Is it a monthly meeting? What, what recommendations would you give to uh, potential first uh, year CAOs or city managers or town managers to start building that relationship between the council and themselves? Yeah, certainly what Lauren touched on, I think it's absolutely uh, important that you're meeting with your head of council on a weekly basis. Um, the mayor is your, your liaison with you between yourself and council. So it's important that you have those conversations with the mayor on a very regular basis so that you're both proceeding in the same direction. Um, I've, I've seen different practices, and one of the ones I really like is having uh, sort of quarterly check-ins, individual check-ins with members of council and going and having a coffee with them and just getting a feel from them what's working, what's not working, what, what they think might be missing or what they would like you like to steer differently than what's happening currently. And it doesn't always mean that that's the direction that's going to happen. Obviously, it's a council decision as a whole. But I think it's important to build those one-on-one -on -one relationships and it, you know, it doesn't have to be weekly with the entire council, but I think the quarterly or semi-annually sit down that is a great practice. And I know there's many municipalities that do that. So that would be one of my suggestions. So before we turn to the second segment here, I'm going to pose a question to all four of you, if you don't mind. And we often hear that relationships can take years to form and be prosperous, but it can take only one day to potentially ruin any potential relationship. And I've got to sort of pose this question before we turn to the next segment, and that is, how do you ensure that that one day doesn't happen? While it's great to meet what is the concrete actions that you have taken in your career paths to ensure that that day doesn't happen? So I'm going to go in reverse order and I'm going to pose that same question to each four of you before we turn here. So in 30 seconds or less, can you say, how do you ensure that that one day doesn't happen and that relationship continues to foster and expand and doesn't become a detriment? Heather? Well, I think uh, an important thing is making sure that all of council is happening. So a very simple method is seeing council on a, a response to an inquiry that's made by the town council. You don't want a uh, specific council to be seen as adding more information than another that might impact the decision. So a simple thing as making sure all of council gets the same information in response to an inquiry. Nicole, what about yourself? Yeah, for us, you know, we put the stage on day one from the council chairman. We put it out 
right on the table. We're going to disagree. Uh, we're going to say things. You know, council's going to say things. I might say things that we, we don't like, um, but we're coming at it from a place of respect and we're trying to be honest with each other. And we talk about what that's going to look like when we do a process, right? We don't hide from it. If something is bothering us, we talk about it. We talk about it right away. We don't let it build or, or fester and get to a point where we we've allowed it to break up. We can have those mature conversations and and get ahead of it before it gets too far. Mike, what about yourself? All some variation of, of those answers, uh, really, you know, like you've already referenced, Chris, I mean, the, the, the primary relationship you end up having is with your mayor. Um, and <clears throat> mayor's office uh, needs to understand that you serve all the council. Um, uh, you know, I'm, uh, thankfully, I don't think I've been in a scenario where, where that isn't the case. But if it weren't, that, that would be a significant area of dysfunction. I think you need to address pretty quickly through some really, really hard discussions. On the assumption that, that you're there, uh, and, and the mayor's office can at least acknowledge and understand that, uh, it all it all kind of flows from there because then you know the best way to maintain them to scrupulousness is, is simply to live it. Um, and uh, you know it's not a matter of oh should I should I delete this email? It's if, if you're thinking about you know you need the need to delete the email, why didn't you type it in the first place? You need to get to the, the fundamental reason behind what you're doing and why you're doing it. So um, again, just simply comes back to uh, keeping yourself in check knowing that you're protecting yourself as best you can even if, if others feel attacked at your end uh, and, I, and i do think for the most part that's we can, we can operate uh, awesome and ron for yourself how do you ensure that you get continue that positive relationship with uh mayor fawcett that you have and i've seen up close and personal when i attended your council meeting earlier last month how do you ensure that that day never comes where that relationship becomes fraught well, I'm pretty good responses, so I, I won't uh, say the same thing over again. I, um, I'll add to it. And so I, I'm a bit of a, a, a realist and, and to the gate you come. Um, your organization is not always going to get it right, and you are going to see the right talent only. And, um, and, and, that, and that happens, or you just, you just, you did read the TV, right? So the okay, will come. Um, I, I have a practice where I sit down with council at least every Order. Um, it's separate when I do my performance review. It is uh, my senior team and trial folks. I need to sit down and we talk about services and talk about what's happening, what's going on. And basically, it's a way to bring onto the table any of those things that were missed. So, I'll add that. That's a, it's a good start. As well. Awesome. Thank you so much. We're going to turn to our next segment, if possible, and we're going to go back to the audience to kick off our next line of questions. So if everyone can answer this on Menti, that'd be greatly appreciated. So the next question is, please rate the level of political acumen skill, your, your level of political acumen skills. A, novice, limited understanding of political dynamics and processes, developing, B, developing some familiarity C, competent, able to navigate the political environment. C, a D, proficient, or E, expert. We're just going to give it a few seconds here. Uh, we're going to be talking about, uh, as you can imagine, politics in the next round. So we're going to be starting off this line of questionings with Nicole. So Nicole, get ready for the first big question to head your way. Uh, we are at about 85. We usually are going to wait till about 100 here. So we'll just continue to answer. So just ask asking for your level of political acumen skills as to you. And it seems that we're, at, we're almost at a tie here with developing and competent. So that is good. Hey, I'm, I'm impressed. Good for you guys. Good for you. So we're about 110. So Nicole, we're going to kick off this line of questions with yourself. What strategies do you employ to ensure that administrative decisions align with the overall vision and priorities set by the council while still fulfilling your administrative responsibilities? So, Nicole, can you answer that for us, please? Yeah, I mean, I think it, it comes down to communication again, right? It's making sure that having those conversations with council to understand what it is they're wanting, but they're also understanding what I have on my plate. And and for the for the capacities that we're the lack of resources sometimes that we're working with, right? And 
and it has to be a balance, then we can, you know, we talk up front, we can do everything. So we got to prioritize. And, and it's checking in regularly to make sure that the priorities haven't changed or something hasn't happened in the community that shifted what we need to focus on. And that when those things do happen, we have the platform in place where we can bring it up and we can shift shift what we need to do in a way where everybody is still able to manage what's on their plate. We can still do what council needs to do, but we can still manage our administrative responsibilities internally. Ron, would you agree with that? What, what would you say if I said <laughs> what would you say if I said no first? <laughs> Sorry, I, I'm having a hard time hearing you there, Ron. I apologize. Yes, I agree with the Oh, <laughs> Awesome. I apologize for that. Um, communication seems to be a key theme over the last first question. And now in this second segment already, um, having those frank discussions is is important. How, Because you are at the will of counsel, how often do you find yourself in your role in challenging what counsel wants because it can't line up with the administrative responsibilities that you currently have in place? Ron? And you're asking how often I communicate. Sorry, I had a hard time hearing you there. You, 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 it seems like you're the one that I have a hard time hearing there, Ron. I apologize. Chris, are you asking how often I communicate? Yeah. How often do you communicate with counsel to ensure that you're fulfilling the responsibilities that they have outlined? in the their mandate of asking administration to do what they've asked so for our organization like we have 700 employees and i'm one person so in our organization it's very important um i, I can't put what's going on everywhere so it's very important that all of my department heads are bringing information forward either to council and information to set up systems and tools for that or um, to bring it to their general manager if they just need to bring it forward to council so it's not just me um, but it is happening on a week a weekly basis so we set up systems in place where council is getting information every week on what they need to know to do their job uh, again on the pain of no surprises we try to use different tools as well. So if some things are you know, urgent, then they might go out to council in an email, uh, they might wait for a council meeting, um, but we're we're using all the tools in the toolbox toolbox to communicate with council um, you know, at, at least they're getting um one one um, set of communication every week from from their administration. Heather, over to you. How should one handle situations where the political will of counsel conflicts with the administrative mandate? We we often I've often heard as a former municipal employee that council directs administration to go plow a certain road because their friend lives on that road or that potential uh, voter is going to vote for them. So they're going to ask the administration to plow their road a little bit more. So how should one handle situations where the political will of a council, councillor or a mayor, mayor's will uh, conflicts with what administration should be doing? Yeah, that's, that's a great question. And it stands back to something that touched on right at the beginning of this panel, and that is role clarity and making sure that council and mayor as part of that council are aware of what their role is in, as a, a governance body as opposed to the day to day operations. And obviously, that doesn't always we, we get those situations where they have members of council or mayor sort of sticking their toes into your little administrative waters and uh, requesting something that may be a, fly against what the priorities of administration are. I think the other important thing, and Nicole touched on it too, is capacity. And that's making sure that council is aware of what the capacity of your, your municipality is. And I'll give you a very brief example. This happened back in the late 2000s, it was the <laughs> council for any reason. But um, they were doing a budget deliberation. And as even back then, well, 
that's been going on for years is the whole uh, infrastructure deterioration and need for making sure the infrastructure is maintained. And one of the councils put forward a motion to add an additional million dollars. So in 2008, I believe it was a million dollars of more water, worth more than it is now, but a million dollars towards uh, road projects. And at the request of the CAO at that point, the city engineer got up and said, you know, I think look at this person I don't know, but we do not have the capacity to take on another million dollars worth of projects. And I'm sure council kind of sat back and went, what? But the reality is that unless you're aware of what your capacities are, that's going to end up as a surplus at the end of the year, and then council's not happy about that either. So I think it's very important that you have those uh, frank discussions with them and, and appreciate that they need to be aware of what exactly you can do and, and to be able to work with in their strategic uh, direction from them. That it does, but it brings up a, another question that I want to ask. And if ever, anyone wants to answer this question, please do. But council expects administration to be able to fulfill their wishes. And uh, I've chatted with the administra administrators and also municipal leaders who say that their role is to direct administration to do what they have asked them to do because they have been elected by the people. And it's about the political will of the council of the day to direct administration to do what they want to do. You're right. Some administrations just will not have the capacity to do that. But maybe a, a council says, well, if you can't do it, we'll bring someone else in to do that job. Is it hard to be honest and frank when you as the city manager, as the CAO, as the CEO, SAO in other provinces, his job is respond uh, literally hinges on the direction of what council wants of the day. Who wants to take that? Anyone? Oh, well, Mike, me. Mike, go for it. Sure, Chris. Just quickly, your your question kind of, kind of reminded me of uh, some friends of mine who sort of a married couple, and the rule they had for each other was: uh, you can tell me what to do or how to do it, but not both. Um, and I always kind of like that, uh, and because I feel it applies well beyond relationships, uh, or, or to your relationship with the council. I, you know, I, I, I have, I've at least developed an empathy for, for all of them as elected officials, because I know they get all the calls. I know that, you know, most of the calls. I know they get a lot of complaints. I know they are out in the community events getting, getting yelled at for the things that are received as not going well. Uh, and so, so I need to understand where they come from when there there are these attempts to micromanage, where they are are losing the plot in terms of the boundaries around roles uh, and 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 some old confusion. So, uh, if you at least start from there and understand where it's coming from, um, you know, back to one of the previous questions, it, you know, at least in Winnipeg, it, it's less about uh, you know political maneuverings and trying to get a certain street clear. It, it's really much simpler. It's it's about micromanagement, uh, trying to decide where what what roads should get through or, or what uh, where where folks should be posting its efforts. So um, again, the, the best we can do, apart from you know holding the process, is still try back to that empathy, still trying to understand what they're trying to achieve, uh, and still trying to to express and communicate as best you can. If if they are perceiving a, a breakdown of service, a breakdown of process. Um, Acknowledging that you you hear them, acknowledging that you're on it, acknowledging that you're actually going to look into what seems to be causing them to be concerned, and rather than just giving them uh, the thing uh, that maybe they shouldn't be asking for, uh, demonstrating that you're you're actually showing some leadership and actually trying to determine whether the process, in fact, needs the kind of changes that, that need to be made, and then involving them if that needs to occur. We have a lot of policies and practices at that city where I do need council to weigh in if we want to change it. Uh, and mentioned snow clearing, and we have a snow clearing and ice control policy of the city. And we can, uh, you know, we used to have to talk about it in front of the campus. And, uh, you know, so that's a perfect example where you can work with them and, and, and try to focus on the things where they should be, try to get them back to within the four quarters, uh, you know, and realizing the lines can be blurry, but get them back to where they need to be and see and, and demonstrate how their efforts, in fact, 
can help assist them in a motion that they can bring uh, that is properly within their domain or authority, uh, and then get them where they need to be, maybe just not after one phone call. Mm -hmm. Just to add to what Mike said, too, I think, especially in a small community, what we see as elected officials, they're the viewers. They've been on board, they're used to hands in, and they don't know anything different, right? And so they come in for their new role as elected officials, and our job to explain to them how important that role is and how powerful it is to have that ability to set the vision and the policy and to show them that this is meaningful work, right? Because it's new for them, they're learning, and I think the more we can empower them and show them show them the importance of what they're doing, it, it does help for hear them away from microwaves that you can use as well. We are a few years after the last municipal election in Manitoba, and the mindset of municipal leaders are going to be shifting shortly here to the next political election. And we all know that elections come and go, and the administration <laughs> will still be constant. How do you get uh, politicians, municipal leaders, out of the mindset of good politics and into the mindset of good governance? Ron, do you want to take that question? Sure. Chris, um, first of all, I try to not use the word politics and, and replace that with community values. And, and that's really where council um, functions best is when they're understanding the community and they're representing the, the values of the community. Um, so um, something that Michael had, had touched on and Nicole a little bit, um, we Dr. Gordon McIntosh, probably you should interview him at some point on your podcast, um, talks about this thing called the gray zone. And that's this the zone between, you know, the areas of I'm calling community values, but you know, the political world and the administration world. And it's not like this. It's not, well, there's your role and there's your role. And so our job as administrators is to work in that gray zone. Right. For me, uh, my you know, my A team is council. And so I have to be working all the time with council at the same time. Uh, I'm working with the administration. So it's working in that gray zone. If you're a bigger municipality, you might have a whole senior team that's working in that area and, and understanding the politics, which Michael was talking about, being empathetic to what what's happening in their world and the email that they're getting, uh, but also understanding organizing capacity that Heather talks about. So it's important for us to know that our job is not administration. Our job is we stay apolitical, but we understand politics. Going back to the original audience participation question before we turn to our next segment here, and this is a question for everyone. Um, how would you rate your political acumen on a scale of one to five? Uh, and has it grown since you've been in the role of city manager or chief administrator officer in that time? Uh, we'll go in the reverse order again from when we started. So we will start with, I believe, Mike, if possible. Uh, I'd like to think somewhere around the four. Uh, five seems like perfection, so I... I, I'll never take perfection, I don't think. Um, I think during my time in the city, like we started at around a one or a two. Uh, I remember very early on uh, when I was in the legal department, uh, just thinking, you know, if, if it wasn't for these counselors, we could just really get our work done. <laughs> <laughs> uh, clearly missing the point, um, but it's understandable uh, because it, it, if you focus on what you think uh, makes sense, and, and then it takes a while before you actually understand uh, where the important priorities are and are supposed to flow from uh, in a level of government like this. So, yeah, I, I, I think around the war, I think, um, yeah, I, it's a, a political role, or, you know, to, to some people lead, lead public service uh, on the administrative side and then go into politics. I, uh, as in, you know, assisting politicians or being chief staff, premier for chief staff, in fact, was in our office uh, prior to uh, Mayor Dillon having been elected. Um, that's not something, I'm not so uh, astute at, at politics that I would ever want that role. I think there are things about politics that you either love it uh, or, or deal with it and live with it. Uh, I mean, I'm in the latter, but, but of course I do, you know, I've got a pretty good understanding. So yeah, let's say more. 
Uh, Nicole, what about yourself? Where would you rate your political acumen? Has it evolved over the years of being a CAO? Um, yeah, I mean, I think, I think I rolled the same, same train of thought as, as Mike. It's, I think it's around the board now, but of course it's evolved, right? I think over the last six years, there's been a lot of challenges. We've had a lot of struggles, and I think sometimes working through those things just keeps you up and gives you that experience you need to really say, yeah, I got this, I understand it. But the other days when um, we caught hard, we didn't see it coming, and we sort of have to learn that until it goes in all of a more. But yeah, I think it's more, but I was a zero when I started for sure. So it's been a long road. Hey, what about yourself, Ron, before I ask Heather? Well, I, I, uh, I'm definitely not to the statures of the two of you, so I'll go with 3.99. <laughs> and, and the reason I say that, Chris, is uh, I'll, I'll, I'll lead in with an example. Um, in 2005, I had my first city manager job, and it was a town of 1,471 employees. Uh, and a population of 1,471 people, about five employees, probably about 10. And the council said, Ron, when are you going to do grade Spruce Drive? I still remember the name of the drive. When are you going to grade Spruce Drive? Now, spruce Drive was, a, was the gist of the province, not for all the acres of work, for all my expenses, all my expenses. And uh, so I went to my public service manager and said, uh, when are we going to raise the price? He said, this is really dry right now. A water truck's broken down. We have to rent one to get ready to it up. We need to just wait a little bit wait. And it's already next week, we're in the forecast, we'll raise the price. Of course, I gave him a business. I was at zero as well. And, uh, and so I did not. And you know, the next week we graded the first drive. And then the mayor came storming in my office about the day before we graded the graded first drive and said, Why are we graded the first drive? So it doesn't make sense to grade the first drive and we graded in a couple days. He said, No, council told me to grade the first drive. And so it was that day that, uh, well, maybe it didn't happen that day, but it happened over time where I realized my role um to understand the pressures in the process and the kind of what's happening that comes around. So that point, uh, myself coming from business, I thought my role was to make good business decisions for the organization. Um, and but some of those good business decisions uh, take the compasses, you know, the values of the whole community. So uh, if if uh, uh, the group drive question were asked me today, I would go back to council and say we would love to raise the group drive. Here is a better option. Um, you have two options, maybe we'll provide them three, and they make that choice. I appreciate that. And Heather, I'm going to throw it over lastly to you, but I'm going to sort of flip the script a little bit because you are the retiree from municipal administration on the panel. Um, I can imagine your political acumen has uh, evolved dramatically from when you first started to where you are today. What advice would you give a new city manager, CAO, to say, okay, if I want to become a five and I'm starting at a zero, this is my first step? Yeah, I, and I totally would concur that I probably started with zero when I was in that when I first started uh, with the city and hopefully zero. So I would say I ran a four point one out of But um, yeah, I think it's important, first of all, to listen and observe what's the political climate of your council. And then not to be afraid to, I don't mean to say no to them because obviously they're your boss, but to, as Ron pointed out, giving them solid options is important. Uh, giving them the information that they may not know to make those decisions. And I, you know, I remember this way, it goes way back to, but um, when the province introduced the requirement for municipal police forces to have a police board, which frankly does, does not have a police board, and a municipal police force. Uh, the council of the day were over beside themselves. They thought the province was interfering. Uh, you know, even though we're a creature of provincial legislation, it was totally unnecessary, and they were not happy about the situation at all. Now, at the time, the province required uh, a resolution from council to say that they were going to create a police board. 
and they didn't want to do it. And yet it was legislated, but it really had no choice. So it was juggling that. And what happened in the end, long story short, is to show their disapproval with the Council of Ken, uh, like seven of them abstained, and we had a two to one vote in favor. But it was a message, a way for them to send the message to the province that while they appreciated that they had really no say in whether they were going to have to you know, create a police board, they were not having to make a decision. So it's being able to know those sort of tricks, for lack of a better word, tools in your toolkit that you can help council meet their political agenda without getting into the legal difficulties or making sure that they're still looking at other uh, strategic directions. Muted. I am muted. I do apologize for that. Uh, we're going to go back to the audience. Uh, so if anyone, uh, everyone can answer this on Menti, that would be very greatly appreciated. Before your current role, did you have administrative municipal experience? Uh, so the uh, answers are no, no, but had leadership experience. Yes, but under five years or yes, with five years or more experience. So again, we're just going to give it a few seconds here. So just before your current role as city manager or CAO or town manager, did you have administrative municipal experience? So we're just going to wait a few seconds here. And we're going to go back to the person we just ended off with. So Heather, be prepared for the first question here, because I think it's an important one. So uh, we'll just give it, oh, we're already at 110 people. So look at that. You guys are on the ball. Greatly appreciate it. So Heather, uh, so for you, how do you believe the role of a, of a municipal administrator has evolved in recent years? particularly in terms of implementing council's decisions while ensuring administrative efficiency? Yes, I think the role has been, you know, we've gone from the days of uh, being the secretary of the board and that's the kind of uh, description that they were. Secretary of Treasury cut the, the checks, the pay the bills, took minutes of meetings. So that, that has changed considerably because the responsibility of the council and the municipalities uh, really have expanded considerably as well. And so, you know, we get downloading from the province and having new responsibilities to look after. You have to become a much uh, more broader in thinking and have a, a expanded skill set to deal with those new responsibilities. Um, I kind of thought it was broad. <laughs> See, that's what happened with retirement. <laughs> um, so I think, you know, obviously that it's, as you develop experience in a, in a municipality, you gain that knowledge base. And I think uh, professional development is huge in that. And in being able to uh, network with your peers and, and so that you do get an understanding of what the changes are out there and what the your role has expanded to and being able to develop the skill sets to meet those challenges. I may have another thought, but I'll leave it at that, and hopefully I can come over to say on that. Ron, can you discuss a specific example of where you, as a municipal administrator, had to exercise leadership and make a significant decision that impacted the direction or development of your municipality? Um, I don't know if I'm on the spot here or not. Um, so we talk, we've talked a lot today about having those tough conversations with your council. Um, sometimes it's, it's, we're doing great work and, and we can just get a couple home runs and we've got big grants, um, and those are very you know, easy conversations to have. And then there's always the harder things. Uh, recently, recently, um, we have all, and then let me just say thank you very much to see a brand with a 9.4% tax increase and it's probably also been happy. And, uh, you know, that's made your life a little easier because we're all under hyperinflation. I mean, hyperinflation, but it's super high inflation, and we all are faced with infrastructure deficits. So, um, this is like a perfect storm for everybody. Uh, for granted, the most of the backstory is our situation we started from a fixed point and then you all start from a fixed point and then you all. So, um, you know, these involve 
uh, conversation. So this would be an example of um, where you want to, you know, dive into some conversations and have them early. Um, when you're trying to make change in an organization, it's important that you okay, break the chain, right? So you, you, you keep tippy toying around the conversation, you will never break the chain. And, and, and then, you know, once you're able to do that, then you can start having conversations with questions. How do we and go for basis? How do we make our mentality even better? How do we not fall into the rut that we didn't like that we were before? But how, do we, how do we stay in the honesty of that? And, you know, for me, um, it was very uh, inspiring to hear our mayor, mayor say that the city progressed, which happened last week. Um, when we talked about you know, city branding um, on, a, on a path of sustainability, on a path of financial sustainability, because to me that meant that that uh, that him, our council, uh, um, our administration are all well on in doing the road going forward and creating a better future. And Chris? Awesome. Mike, over to you. How do you ensure that your decision-making process as the chief administration officer in your community is informed by community input and aligns with the long-term goals and priorities of the municipality? In a few ways, Chris. So sometimes in a very deliberate or structured way. So we have you know, things like our poverty reduction strategy or our, you know, newcomer development and inclusion strategy. We, we created them to have mechanisms that, that mandate uh, the kind of engagement, the kind of constant dialogue that we need, that we know we need uh, to, to be making properly informed decisions to, to have our departments bring forward, uh, you know, just well-informed, well-rounded uh, decisions based upon a lot of engagement. So, you know, the, the more you can, in fact, create mechanisms that, that automatically uh, require mandate uh, for the for all the right reasons, that kind of engagement, that's useful. Um, I, I'm, I'm sure everyone has some different variation of the rhythm or dynamic in their municipality, but I really do try to, uh, as frequently as I can, have the right dialogue with as many stakeholders as I can. I have regular lunches set with a number of them who represent large constituencies represent uh, you know a number of uh, stakeholders that interact with the city even our own chamber of commerce want to thank thank them every year they do an annual civic leaders dinner where in fact their members uh you know pay to come and, and hang out with us clubs uh and uh, elected officials and, and folks on my senior management team uh really just to, to sit, sit at the table uh break bread together and actually talk about what matters to them and learn a little bit more uh, from each other uh, about how how we interact, how we can support them. So, um, yeah, as much as you can create that structure where engagement uh, matters and and is regular and is required in, in how you move forward on on initiatives, uh, and then the personal effort uh, that you're all prepared to put in there, uh, having those discussions, making sure that you actually feel like you understand the lay of the land, regardless of what some report might say. Uh, that you've actually tried to do the job. Now, before I ask Nicole here, I just want to make sure that I am still good for time here. I just want to, I'm, I'm looking at Dwayne. I just want to make sure that I am not going to go over time at any time here. So, do I still have about 10 minutes here, or do I need to start wrapping up? 10 minutes is good. Okay, perfect. Uh, so, Nicole, um, in a smaller community, in a rural community, it can be daunting, particularly around that uh, that community input aspect, because there are so spread out and getting everyone into one spot, it can be hard. Is it challenging in rural communities to make those decisions that are informed by that community input that municipalities so rely on? It can be right. There's no, there's no being anonymous in a small town, and we all know we go to the coffee shop and then hear about it, right? That's the best. It's the place where the decisions get made in a small town, right? Or for that facade, and um, 
Yeah, so I mean, it, it's it's tough. It's it's different, um, but it's still it's still important to be be there, be part of those conversations. But I mean, we just see it in a bit of a different. It's a bit more organic for us being in a small community because we do have those informal conversations. But I find sometimes those are more impactful. You know, a small town, you know, it's just, it's the same people who always complain, and the good ones and the happy ones never fall right, but. The happy ones can be found if you go out and you look and you talk to them and you, you make a point, right? So it's different, but it's, it's still an impactful. I appreciate that. And we're going to go to our final question for the audience participation, if we don't mind. And if everyone can go to their mentee, that'd be greatly appreciated. And the question is, in your opinion, rank the following functions of a municipal administrator in order of importance. A, effectively implementing council's decisions, serving as a neutral mediator between council and community stakeholders, advocating for community needs and priorities while navigating political pressures, D, fostering an innovative and strategic planning, or E, delivering effective and efficient municipal services. Here we go. And we're going to start the line of questioning off here with Mike, and it's going to be the same question for all four of you, so that way we can uh, make sure we're good on time here. Um, so uh, we're just waiting. Okay, we're at 42, so we'll give it a few more seconds here. Uh, but I'll, I'll start reading the question while we're still waiting for the results to roll in because I'm cautious of time. So this is a question for everyone, but we're going to start with Mike. Um, municipal administrators can often be a lonely job, balancing the political complexities with the administrative realities. How important is it to reach out to your fellow administrators across the province to bounce ideas off of and find best practices to fit your community? Uh, Mike, if you want to take that uh, while we, yeah, if you want to start off, that'd be greatly appreciated. Um, I'm going to say very important. Uh, it's uh, it's part of the reason not only am I known for many years, but uh, even even a group like this, um, I, I knew full well, well when we started having our discussions to, on this topic a year or two ago. Uh, I wanted to see how how they could come back to the table. It would be a, a very obvious omission for years, simply having you know dropped out and not participated in, in a long time, um, and or through AMM and Dennis is here. Um, it, it, it is very important. The, the flip side, at, at the city of Winnipeg, uh, there's often, um, you know, because it's such a large municipal organization, uh, there's often probably a stereotype, I, I think, in, in Winnipeg municipal administrators' minds that they may not even have anything relevant to offer other municipal administrators, just because it, it, it sometimes feels like apples and oranges. Um, and, uh, but, but I think we've broken through that mindset, uh, because there will be a lot of things that don't, uh, that don't necessarily translate. Um, there are probably almost everyone in this room has a better working knowledge of exactly how that municipal municipality operates than I do at the city. And I say that because I can't possibly have a, 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 a full knowledge of what every uh, one of this, those 10,300 employees uh, are doing on a daily basis. I, I do need to have what I feel is a solid understanding of it, um, but, but I really do think in terms of the bread and butter of municipal uh, affairs, you know, the, the folks in this room in particular that had on this panel that come from small municipalities likely have a more fundamental understanding of that. And, and in that sense, you know, that's probably the principle that that I, I'm able to remind myself and, and my own team how we can really learn uh, and really benefit from this from this interaction. Uh, far in mind, of course, finding any bandwidth or time or capacity uh, to engage in that discussion is, is always a challenge. But it's a challenge for everyone in the team as well. So, um, yeah, I, I, I would consider it uh, very important, despite feeling like uh, an apple among a lot of orange. <laughs> 
Uh, for N Nicole, I'm going to throw it over to you to follow up on what Mike just said there. From coming from a smaller uh, rural community, how important is it to reach out to your fellow administrators across the province? It's everything. I mean, when I started, I had years of experience, but this world was totally new to me, and I. I didn't have a hot clue what I was doing, right? And thankfully, our, our council had already had our previous staff as members of MMA, and I got into this place, and I got to meet so many wonderful people, and I learned from so many of them, and it, it completely changed my confidence and my ability to do what I had to do and, and make change and, and be impactful, and, and I feel good at my job. Um, and, you know, coming from that, that's where we develop things like the mentorship program for MMA and giving people that opportunity to make connections based on common areas of focus and, and trying to fill that gap and stress the importance of connecting because it will change your career. I mean, and the people you meet will open doors and and you just never know where it's going to go. But I mean, it is probably one of the most important things I would say to any administrator. You've got to do it. You've got to get out push past your comfort zone, shake hands with new people, sit at a new table, right? We all sit with our friends, go meet somebody else. You never know what you're going to learn from them. And you can take that back and, and do great in the community. Now, I, I've been told, I've, I've been listening to you all, and I, I every time that I ask a question to all four of you, by the third person, I say I'm going to reiterate what the last person just said. So I'm going to, for the last two people, I'm going to change up the question a little bit. So for Ron, if you don't mind, what is the one piece of advice that you would have wanted to have had if you could go back and tell yourself before entering into the world of municipal administration? I can go back and, and tell Ron um, that that uh, you work for council. Um, you know, you know, you run an organization where there's there's ten employees or over ten thousand three hundred employees. Um, that you work you work for council. You're at their pleasure. Um, you get home runs for that. You get home runs for council. You're getting home runs for the city and I your job. And so that would be um, what I would tell myself. A lot of your role, 95 percent of it, is in the day-to-day -day operation. It is the administrative side. It's, it's delivering services. So even though that is the that's the, the easy stuff, you're, you're, you're staff and, and you're doing the great work. But for you as an administrator, um, your role is to be is to deliver helpful priorities. Awesome. And now to finally to Heather, uh, what's the one piece of advice that you would want to wish you would have had prior to entering into the world of municipal administration that you could wish you could go back and tell your younger self? Yeah, I think uh, when I was saying to myself is Heather, you are not on an island. There is a vast resources out there that you can tap into. And, you know, we all can talk about why are we reinventing the wheel? We think we have unique issues that we have to deal with on a daily basis. Everybody's dealing with those when we are not. And I think it's so important to keep that networking system open, being open as Nicole said, to meeting new people and hearing new ideas and not being afraid to reach out and get help. It, it's, it's not a um, scar on you. It, it, you know, it doesn't mean that you're weak or an ineffective administrator. It means that you have seen that there is a uh, deficiency in, in your knowledge base or in your skill set that you need help with. So don't be afraid to reach out. Thank you. Uh, I want to thank everyone for following along in today's panel, but I also want to thank uh, our four great panelists who are up on the stage. If I can get a round of applause for all four of them, they'd be greatly appreciated because I think they did a wonderful job in answering all those great questions. And I also want to take a moment and apologize for not being with you in beautiful Brandon, Manitoba. I'm looking forward to visiting Manitoba later this summer when I travel across the province in an RV and visiting some of the communities that I've gotten to know and meet and talk with counselors. So maybe 
I'll be up in your neck of the woods. So if you want, uh, I will. With that, I want to thank MMA for inviting me to participate in the conference. And now for a shameless plug, because I wouldn't be doing my job without doing that. If you're ever looking to listen to municipal leaders from across Manitoba and around Canada talk about their communities, please head over to the crossborderinterviews.ca and listen to all of our past shows and future shows. Over the next few weeks, we'll be sitting down with 15 municipal leaders from across the province of Manitoba. Now, back to you, Dwayne.